I'm Jill Saunderson and I'm an activist in the peace movement from Anstruther Fife. Rob Nicholson, um, organising uh, Fife CND. I'm Janet Fenton, one of the vice chairs for the Scottish CND. I'm Iona Hancock, I've set up a university based group in the University of Aberdeen. My name is Isabel Lindsay. I've been part of the peace movement since 1960. My name is Brian Quayle, I've been in the Scottish CND for donkey's years. I joined, uh, when I was 16, I, I joined the Labour Party and there in 1960 uh, there were a few people whom I met and we decided we would set up Lanarkshire c and I was brought up in a very political house and so um, from very early age politics and from late 50s the nuclear weapons, the American submarines coming into the Holy Loch it was part of our chat around the kitchen table and of course I became involved in the youth CND then. I got an email for the Peace Academy through um, my university and I just thought it really looked really interesting because I don't believe that we should have nuclear weapons but I had no real idea of how to go about protesting or getting involved. I've always felt like I wanted to get involved with something but I wasn't really sure how. Um, and I feel as, um, the best way to the best way to you know, could change something is to understand it. Our, our CND rally, that's the first time I remember I was getting involved. A young red-haired man called Robin Cook made a brilliant speech. It was so powerful I can remember the substance of his argument. And I was there in Josh Quill and I thought, that is it. And then and then I joined CND. When I first got involved, it was a result of going to a poetry reading in a little shop coffee shop in Edinburgh and in between the poems they were reading excerpts from John Hersey's book on Hiroshima and what that meant and I'd kind of grown up in the aftermath of the Second World War and I had been encouraged to be aware of the Nuremberg trials and the efforts for peace in Europe I, from Edinburgh which had a festival that was all about cultural sharing and mutual understanding. So when I found out that that had happened, I think I very naively imagined that uh, the US government would be taken to Nuremberg shortly after that. I mean, there's a bit of me that still thinks that should happen. So I just got involved. Well, as a small child, I remember the surrender of Japan. I remember the tram cars, ticket letters in the, in the window, VJ, VJ, VJ victory in Japan and it was a universal rejoicing the war is over hallelujah well since I've been a child I knew about nuclear weapons we called it the atomic bomb then my father was in Hiroshima with British forces after the bomb had been dropped so I mean we had in our house a, a melted beer bottle he would picked up on the outskirts of the city uh, and one or two pictures so really, I was always aware that this was a reality. I asked my mother about what was this thing called the atom bomb. She had no notion of what the atom bomb actually did because no one. Did. I think she had divisions of people sort of being dematerialized and drawn up to heaven like motes in a sunbeam. Because at the time of Hiroshima and for 20, many decades afterwards, very strong censorship. No one saw human images of Hiroshima until 40 years when the, later when, the, when it was declassified. The films were declassified. One of the big political mistakes 
that were made by those that think these weapons are useful was that they actually let us understand what they actually did and what they were about, and that's changed. They talk about missile defence, they talk about nuclear deterrence, they've invented a f language that has absolutely nothing to do with what the weapons are and do. The bomb threatens to rob us of time. While we are here in this room talking, there's a man sitting at a control panel in a trident submarine waiting for the order to press the button. That'll be the end. I've got a big family, I've got a lot of children, and I would like them to be engaged in a world that does things in a different way, that does things in a way where we can share resources and look after one another, all of that kind of stuff. It was towards the end of 1960 when suddenly we were all told that within three months there was going to be a major nuclear base in Scotland. Uh, no consultation, no discussion, uh, it was a done deal in order to get a British Polaris deal to concede to the Americans that they have a base and a base that was very close to Glasgow because it was convenient for Presswick, it was convenient for sailors to have the amenities of the city. So that is what really uh, enabled the movement to take off in Scotland. Uh, there were so many people so angry at this development. In, in the space of weeks, actually, there were major demonstrations and that continued. Can I tell you a wee story? When I started teaching way back 62, I went into the classroom one morning. There's a group of girls quietly crying in the corner. I said to them, what's wrong girls? They said to me, oh sir, is it true the world's going to end today? This was the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. But it wasn't until 30 or 40 years later that we realised how right they were to be petrified. Well, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, I was involved, I was a CND member, but I was actively involved with the Committee of 100, which was the Civil Disobedience Wing. We had a small office in Glasgow. I had been at university during the day, and then when we heard what was happening, many people were phoning, getting in touch. and. The evening that the, uh, uh, the story broke, uh, we managed to have a small march in Glasgow. So we immediately tried to organise marches. Every, every plan, hope or aspiration you have presupposes the continued existence of this world as a stage in which to act this out. If these things are used, whatever dreams you have, there'll be no platform for them to be realised. After the 60s, when we moved into the 70s, there was a situation in which people thought things were stabilised. We were still fighting against the Vietnam War uh, in the early 70s and other disputes. But uh, I think the wider public felt things have calmed down, things have stabilised. But when we get into the early 80s, the Thatcher-Reagan era, uh, and of course the new generation of missiles, cruise missiles and so on, uh, we then had a very, very heightened and expanded anti-war movement, anti-nuclear movement then, not just in the UK, uh, but throughout Europe. Scotland is drawn into nuclear war planning against the will of the Scottish people. Scotland is a small country, bristling, with everything you could think of to do with nuclear weapons. We've got two nuclear bases within an hour's drive of here, the centre of the Scottish population, Glasgow. One is British, one belongs to the United States. They're both nuclear bases with nuclear-armed submarines. We've got nuclear power plants, including one in the north of Scotland for the production of plutonium. We've got communication systems, the length and breadth of Scotland. I think there always has been a rebellious strand in Scotland and a non-conformist strand. The music that really took off in Scotland with the songwriting group, the musicians who were active here, was mischievous, cheeky, challenging, two fingers up <laughs> to the opposition. <laughs> the ding-dong dollar, you can't spend a dollar when you're dead. And people sang these songs, they were written to be sung. 
The Covenant was a book illustrated by Alistair Gray, which had this core value statement, we desire that Scotland should contribute to international peace and justice rather than being a launch pad for waging war. People were using the book for christenings of babies, you know. It was one of the church leaders that managed to get his parishioners to drag out the covenant and get people to sign it every time he did a christening. It was great, you know. When the Holy Lock base shut down, uh, th there were mixed feelings because had this represented a, a genuine reduction in nuclear killing power, then obviously it would have been very welcome. But it wasn't really this. It was simply, technically, they didn't need the base anymore. And they had kept the base for essentially political reasons during the Cold War. We'd always been told that it would be disastrous for the Danoon economy uh, if the base closed. And in fact, that didn't occur. It bounced back reasonably, and it was most certainly not the economic disaster that many had said would occur. The peace camp in Resyth was set up on International Women's Day, I think about 1981, and a group of women in Fife had decided to meet and have a picnic in St Andrews and from there we all set off some on motor scooters and went down and supported the peace camp that was actually placed on a roundabout and I think they stayed there for about six months. It was quite incredible and for me Five Women for Peace was evolved out of that picnic and going down to that peace camp and peace camps were springing up all over the place but it was a women's peace camp and they were in support of Greenham Common as well. When I went away and researched more into, into the whole nuclear issue myself and found that um, on my doorstep in, in Fife there's the Rosyth Naval Base and they've got the decommissioned sub sitting there. There's 20 in total in the UK, 8 of which are in Rosyth and one of them has been sitting, HMS Dreadnought, has been sitting there longer than it's been used in active service, which is quite appalling to be honest. The individual has got to make his or her own personal decision. What do I do about this now? And that's very, very important. It was Mr. Churchill of Scotland who said he was at a demonstration in, in Fast Lane and he was told, him, don't go on the road, don't go on the road. And he's on the pavement. Everyone says the pavement. In this life, we all stay in the pavement. But he stepped off and he said, stepping onto the road, road was the most liberating experience of my life because he freed himself his own fears, the mind forged manacles of man, mankind. Our fears are forged in our own mind and they, they keep us back, they inhibit us. But he broke those manacles and walked onto the road and he felt a great sense of liberation. That's a very, a very profound thing that he said and I think it's true of everybody. If we learn to forsake the lifetime habit of craving obedience, most people just do what they felt. In the early 60s, uh, we, we were having to try and think of what different ways can we find to try to focus attention on what's happening. Because the problem is that many demonstrations, uh, there are diminishing returns, that we had organised the first sit-down demonstrations in Scotland. But there is diminishing media interest and we still, we need media, we need communication to the wider public. Uh, we didn't have the kind of means of communication directly to people that we have today. We had to think of imaginative ways. Uh, so on several occasions, we had protest fasts, in particular trying to draw attention to the terrible waste of resources on nuclear weapons when we had starvation still taking place in various parts of the world. So we had, a group of us had a five-day fast uh, outside the Faslane base. Uh, we also had a similar five-day fast at the Rosias base. Difficult to communicate in many ways with the sailors directly. Many of them were made to feel uncomfortable obviously because we were <laughs> intense there <laughs> and not eating. Rosyth was more difficult because 
some drunken sailors came, rolled us up in the tents and kicked us down a, <laughs> kicked us down a slope. But th there were no serious injuries arising from it. But it, it was a way of trying to attract attention to what was happening in Scotland. I met two Australians from Footprints for Peace. They were walking around the world for peace and I became involved. And we walked from Dublin to London. I did six weeks of that. And then the following year we walked from London down to Portsmouth and then from Portsmouth across the channel from Cherbourg to Geneva, which was 1,200 miles. And that took 12 weeks. And I, I'm very proud to say I walked all 1,200 miles. And the following year we walked from Geneva to Brussels, which was a further 1,200 miles and a 12, further 12 weeks. And more recently, we walked from Iona to London, which was 800 miles. And we managed at the end to knock on number 10 Downing Street and hand in the petition and a peace crane hanging for the children. And I was very proud to have done that. And this became my favourite way of campaigning. I felt that as you're walking through all the towns, you meet people on the street, you can talk to them, you're pe meeting people in their workplace and in different places. And it's very different from just leafleting on a street. We felt we met a lot of people, made a lot of, you don't know who you're talking to and where that little pebble in the water can spread to. And I felt that that was my favourite way of campaigning. And I spent decades weaving daffodils into fences and very poetic and meaningful gestures and got nowhere. So the time has come, well, from my, in my opinion anyway, that we've really got to be much stronger and more resolute and more courageous uh, in, in taking direct action because it's for real. The, the, they, are, they are not carrying on. In the early 80s, Greenham Common um, set up a women's camp. Um, I was always very supportive of it. Organised lots of buses to go down to demonstrations. There um, was an amazing demonstration and the women, just by gently pressing on the fence, actually managed to bring down the entire fence in that area and it really showed what women's power without violence and just very gently. It's amazing what women can do. Not four or five guys sitting on, on, on a side of the road on, on a fence sort of thing and one of them said to me, hello Brian, I said, I didn't know him who he was but he'd seen me on Facebook or something. He said to me, are you going to stop the convoy today? And I, me, you know, just, <laughs> I said, well, if I can, but I don't have much chance of one, and, and, and the, one chance of, any chance of one person stopping it. And this guy, Alistair Robertson, said, right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hand. I thought, well, great. He crossed and we went to the other side. And they saw a convoy come around, the first vehicle went through, and then there was a slight gap, and he walked out from one side and did that. I walked out from the other side and did that. Oh, yeah, beauty, it slowed down. It slowed down. I thought, yes. So I asked the sat in the room, I went under the, the vehicle. I thought, it's going to take you longer to, take longer to get me out. Now is the time and now is the hour. Either we have a future without nuclear weapons or we have no future at all. So while some things change, uh, the passion and the working together and trying to make sense of what's going on and challenge is just the same. We just need to keep doing it. I don't like it. I hate it actually. There are so many other beautiful things I'd rather do in this world. I love flowers and plants in the garden and I love people and history, m music, many, many other things, but they're all threatened. I don't want nuclear weapons just out of Scotland because as long as nuclear weapons exist, we will never be able to achieve any of the sustainable development goals. We'll never be able to feed ourselves. We'll never be able to tackle climate change. We'll never be able to devise systems of government that allow people to have control over their own communities and, and where they live in a realistic and free kind of way. We won't be able to address any of these problems as long as nuclear weapons exist, as long as they're in, un, under the control of a tiny minority, the tiny minority of men, and I say that advisedly, who decided to have them in the first place and who decided behind closed doors in secret to acquire these 
terrible threats to all of our existence. Horrendous evil we have already done. But apart from Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we've exploded over a thousand nuclear bombs, which have released tons of radioactive material, which is still in the atmosphere, and slowly percolating down. The first thing, obviously, is the ionising radiation, which affects women's bodies so much more than it affects men's bodies. And the arrogance with which all the measurements on the impact of ionising radiation is, is based on the impact on a healthy young male. And yet, if you think about a nuclear weapon being detonated over a city, as happened in Hiroshima, a very high percentage of the people that would be impacted uh, in the, that are far enough away from the epicentre to survive are going to be women and children. So the, the actual impact on women's bodies and children's bodies enormously increased. So that's one of the reasons why it's a women's issue. Well, for many, many years, the women's role, not only in the peace movement, I think women politically, they don't believe that they should be political. Very uh, gendered views of how we organise certain aspects of society. It's that idea of equating strength and control and might and non-negotiation, secrecy, power structures and hierarchies as a way of resolving conflict. It doesn't work. We ascribe to men and then we insist that they behave according to those roles. The other approach, which is ascribed as a female approach of listening, negotiating, uh, meeting people's needs, making people feel safe, uh, and not undermining them. The, the people that are working like that, these are all the female qualities. These are the ones that will actually resolve problems and would prevent nuclear weapons from ever being developed in the first place, let alone continuing at this, at this point. We all know in our real lives, in our family disputes, it doesn't work. So often you hear women still saying, oh, I need to ask my man what he says, we don't have a divided house here. And actually women need to know the link between how their lives are and that politics and nuclear weapons, they actually have a say in it and their voice is important. An example of a guy that was uh, one of the early um, diplomats that was engaged in nuclear weapons diplomacy and one of the things that they were talking about was um, how many people this particular weapon would be required to kill in order to be effective. The UK's idea of enough nuclear weapons was enough to kill enough people in Moscow to ensure that the state was no longer able to actually function. So they were having this conversation and this guy suddenly thought, wait a minute, what are we, what are we actually talking about here? And he said, but we're, we're talking about these people's lives. And there was absolute silence. And he said, I realised I've made a big mistake. I'll never do that again. I felt like a woman. Going through the experience I've had with the peace movement, it's given me um, hope, sort of knowing that, there, what we said before, knowing that there's other people out there that feel the same. And it's kind of inspired me. Uh, so, more worried, because <laughs> we can still fix things, we can still change things, it's just, it's just about coming together. I think the most um, powerful moment, member moment, was the, the talk from um, the survivor of the Hiroshima bombing, um, his, his um, detailed um, story about, about what his family went through kind of put a real like, human context on what these things can do and why 
right now, especially with everything going on with the UN, is a really important time to try and um, get our voices heard. I think it's important to stay engaged because it affects us the most, um, where eventually we're going to have to deal with it too. So in my eyes it makes sense to start early and learn about things earlier so that you're better equipped to deal with it, regardless of what you believe or like how you believe it. I think at least educating is a good start that will prepare you for when you actually do have to do something about it. But I think there's a lot of suggestion that young people are less engaged or more apathetic. And I, in my optimism, don't actually think that's the case. Uh, when I see people like you, uh, my own children, and uh, how engaged they are, how much more knowledgeable that they are. I think a lot of young people um, are really passionate, but they don't know how to go about it. Um, and I think that passion is so important and the main thing that they, they could bring um, because you know you could go to a student union anywhere and you could strike up a conversation about nuclear weapons and you just see people so willing and ready to be part of something or to say, you know, speak their mind on it um, but um, they don't necessarily get involved but the passion is like there. Um, so it's harnessing that and using that, definitely. Um, the talks about fundraising and the more general side um, was really interesting for me because I was interested in starting something up pretty early on when I arrived. Um, so it was really interesting to find the details of that and how to go about it. Um, it's had a massive impact. Um, I think on a more practical level, it's taught me to like be really confident and like do whatever you need to do to make change um, but I also think it's really opened my eyes um, to see how positive some people are about the movement. You know before I went to the Peace Academy I sort of thought oh that's really awful but no one cares, you know, no one, like it's just a thing we have to deal with, we have to deal with nuclear weapons. Um, but doing the Peace Camp and then meeting others as I've sort of started to create something in Aberdeen um, has made me realise how many people actually do want change and how they're really willing and able to do it. It's really inspiring. I think for younger people coming up, the important thing to realise is that this, together with the issues of climate change, are the two big things that we can never be complacent about. These are the things that have the capacity to destroy our world. All kinds of other issues are important. They come, they go, there's great suffering perhaps involved, but these two issues have the capacity to destroy the world as we know it. In some ways, the nuclear issue is one that could happen so much faster. It could happen at any time. And we have always, always to remember that no human being should ever be allowed the power to press a button and to destroy huge parts of the planet and many millions of people, perhaps in a way that will result because of all the environmental impact that it would also have in the destruction of mankind. I think it's a really important time to get involved um, because of obviously the political climate that we're going on right now um, with Brexit as well, um, as well as what's going on with the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons Treaty. Um, and we need to really put pressure on the UK to try and get involved with that, um, especially like young people when you get young people's, young people's voices heard. Well, the treaty is uh, the good news. The treaty is uh, what has happened, and that has arisen out of the changes in the way that society is organising itself, the fact that it's much more difficult to keep secrets, it's much more difficult to keep uh, control, top-heavy control, uh, in a world that can communicate with itself. Um, so what happened with the treaty is really just an example of, of a, a majority view actually gaining the upper hand. Um, so the majority of people in the world want rid of nuclear weapons. That's a fact. Uh, the majority of governments in the world want rid of nuclear weapons. 
and the only process for negotiating disarmament, which was the first resolution that was held by United Nations. When United Nations was formed in 1946, the very first resolution was to get rid of nuclear weapons. And they've failed to put that into practice because they've been stopped by the, the governments of the countries that have nuclear weapons. So having a process that wasn't where it wasn't allowable for those nation states to say no, to stop it, but to have it as a completely open discussion ended up with 122 member states of the United Nations all agreeing that this treaty should exist. But it doesn't just say you can't have nuclear weapons, it says you can't make nuclear weapons, you can't store nuclear weapons, you can't let other people dump nuclear weapons in your country, you can't enter into a nuclear alliance with somebody that's got a nuclear weapon. Very importantly, it says you can't threaten to use nuclear weapons, which makes the whole policy, the so-called deterrence theory, completely unmanageable. Nuclear weapons are very expensive to produce and manufacture and get all the bits and get the technical expertise. So it's done by investment from multinational companies. Uh, even before it enters into force, it's already having an impact on governments around the world. The, in particular, through divestment. There's been 50 major financial institutions that have divested from nuclear weapons since the treaty came, was adopted at United Nations. You cannot say that the UK has a democratic mandate to renew its nuclear weapons. It's not just like a minority view in an opinion poll, it's actually people have voted for politicians that don't support nuclear weapons. Scotland is, the, is unique in that it is the only country in the world, and we are a country, we're, we're not a state, but we're a country within a state and we have the capacity to disarm a nuclear armed state. But here's a cosmic joke. The doomsday clock, which is maintained not by peace fanatics, but by international scientists. The doomsday work right, clock right here now today it is closer to midnight than it's ever been at any time in the past, even when those girls were crying a terror in my classroom. It is closer to midnight now than it's ever been. But nobody's caring. We are so normalised and habituated it, to it that we still don't see it. Remember your humanity and forget this. It's a moral issue which dwarfs all the others into relative insignificance. And God knows that the others are, are important. But this is a plain moral, moral issue. Either, either we choose life or we choose death. There are a lot of people that think nuclear weapons are a good idea or they keep this peace for 70 years. A lot of them, if they're in the military, they choose to change their minds when they retire. People don't change their minds in the other direction. They really don't. The most you get is, is people that will politically change allegiance without any real commitment. But people that really understand what nuclear weapons are capable of don't suddenly decide they're a good idea. I, I think a lot of the time we can feel that we're not having an impact when actually we're making huge, huge changes. And when you think about the Berlin Wall and the point at which the Berlin Wall came down, suddenly, you know, it seemed it was there forever and suddenly it, it happened. And I mean, we all have different views of what the impact of the Berlin Wall coming down might mean for us now. But at the time, it was the unthinkable to the actual, almost, almost taking people by surprise. And I think that's eminently possible. And that's one of the things I feel about the, the TPNW. And a lot of the reason for that not seeing it coming is because we forget our own history and we forget what's, what's actually happened. If you don't talk about nuclear weapons, then people forget what they do. People forget how evil they are. People forget how much 
of the way in which our society is controlled is about allowing for the maintenance and continued reliance for security, so-called, on nuclear weapons, unless we keep them to the forefront. We absolutely, absolutely have to do that. And in a way, it's more difficult when you're actually going through a successful phase in your campaign, uh, because you're pushing an open door. Uh, but, but we have to do it. It's absolutely vital that we do it. What does it mean to me? I, mean, I think it's, it's just, it's part of me. I mean, I'm, as I say, I'm a mum. I'm also a Quaker. I'm a Scot. All of these things are part of my identity. And being opposed to nuclear weapons is a huge part of my identity. I find it very difficult to get through a day without talking about it to somebody. This is, this is something that applies to all kinds of campaigning activities, that you don't know when the time is going to be when something happens and you have a real opportunity to change things, but you're not going to be able to change things unless you have the structures in place to do it, to take advantage of the situation, to act. That much of the activity may be boring, may be tedious, may seem to be fruitless for year after year after year. But the time might come when suddenly things change. And if you are there, you know what you want to achieve, you can jump in and provide leadership. And since I've been in the peace movement since 1958, Scottish CND has played a big part in keeping me interested and involved in the movement and I've been a very, very, very happy to be a part of it for the last 60 years. That's what I wanted to say. <laughs> Is that okay? Everybody's talking about Thatcherism, fascism, goodism, badism. Don't you wish you hadism? Just a patent fadism. Politics is madism. All we are saying is give peace a chance. All we are saying is give peace a chance. Everybody's talking about arms control, on the dole, dig the coal, BMO, everybody's up the pole, save the world, lose your soul. All we are saying is give peace a chance. All we are saying is give peace a chance. Everybody's talking about weapons freeze, on our knees, thank you please, Japanese, one of those or one of these, wear a kilt and enjoy the breeze. All we are saying is give peace a chance.